Oke, okay. thank you Kak Weli uh, atas kesempatannya. Selamat sore Bapak Ibu, perkenalkan lagi saya Beta dari PSLA ITB. Uh, mungkin karena sesinya bakal bahasa Inggris, mungkin saya bakal nge-hostingnya pakai sedikit-sedikit bahasa Inggris ya Bapak Ibu ya. Kita coba dulu aja. Oke, okay. nah, uh, first of all, uh, on this occasion I'll be your host for this afternoon session, of course, but I will not be your moderator because we will have a great moderator and also the speaker for today. But in this session, we will be educated about wastewater treatment, especially regarding biological treatment. More specifically, we will discuss in sufficient detail about the biological wastewater treatment design in warm climate regions. Why does this matter? As we know, the characteristic of waste generally vary for different regions. And furthermore, in biological processing, where you, we're going to using the organism and biological organisms. And these processing organisms also generally work optimally in specific environmental conditions. So for warm tropical climates country like in Indonesia, we will learn about this technique in more relevant way. We will both learn about biological treatment for wastewater in warm climates as in Brazil also, that we will be, uh, the speaker will be coming from uh, the Brazil also. So without wait any longer, we will be taught by a professor from the Federal University of Minas Gerais or FUMG, who is experienced in what we will learn in the session. He also the author of several textbooks and wastewater treatment published in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And then we will also moderate it by our professor from ITB, Professor Chandra. And in this great session, we're going to moderate it and the speaker also from, from Professor also. So with all the following experience, we hope to gain interesting scientific knowledge and discussion in the session. Okay, without wait any longer, immediately, Professor Chandra, you may start the session right now. Thank you. Thank you, Beta. So, Marcos, uh, hello, Marcos. Hello. <clears throat> yes, great. Great, Marcos. Great. <laughs> so, uh, we will start uh, our session, Marcos. And yes. probably I just uh, uh, give the introduction of you. Of course, uh, uh, so I would like to uh, introduce Professor uh, Marcos uh, von Sperli. Uh, so he's a he's a famous uh, professor uh, in civil in the environmental engineering. Uh, he got a PhD from the Imperial College uh, London. Now he is the professor in the uh, Federal University of uh, Minas Gerais in Brazil. So and also fellow of the International Water Association, and also honorary member for a numbers of the uh, others uh, international association and also is uh, editor of the uh, journal IWA journal in water sanitation hygiene for development and also uh, uh, there will be uh, he also he author a number of uh, books especially regarding uh, wastewater treatment design uh, for the warm climate so it's the Time is yours, uh, Marcos, so that uh, Beta probably, so uh, Marcos, you will control the, the presentation or will help by uh, Beta? Okay, I, I think I can try to control because then I can pass the slides. Okay. Maybe it okay. will be easier. But just okay, a first great. question, do you hear me well and do you see me well? Is everything okay? Yes. Everything great. okay, sir? Great, great. Everything's okay, good. Yes, great. So, well, initially, before sharing my screen, I would like to thank very much Professor Chandra Setiadi and the friends that I got to know at ITB. It is really an honor to me to participate at this webinar. I remember very well the very good moments we had together with Professor Chandra Setiadi and his research group during the UNESCO IAT, uh, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Network, uh, for the sanitation for the urban poor. I think it was a fantastic network and we got to learn very much from each other. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to see you back. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Is it okay? Can you see my screen? Is it working well? Well, I guess so, yes. is it? Yes, yes. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, 
as uh, you have already been told, so before that, good afternoon to everyone. It's good morning here in Brazil. We have 10 hours of difference. So good morning for me, good afternoon for you. As it has already been mentioned, we will talk about sewage treatment processes for warm countries, warm regions, and also I incorporated in the title developing countries. Brazil is a developing country, so I think there are some specific comments for warm countries and developing countries in the selection of wastewater treatment processes. So it has been mentioned, I work at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais is one of the states in Brazil and we have different federal universities. So I work in the Southeast of Brazil in the state of Minas Gerais in the city of Belo Horizonte. Okay, our presentation outline, what are we going to cover in this presentation? Initially, I will give you some slides showing the open access literature on wastewater treatment I have been involved with. So it has already been mentioned that I wrote some textbooks on wastewater treatment. I would like to share with you because they are open access. Then we will cover just simple methods for sewage treatment in developing countries. I will give a very short description I imagine that most of you already know these processes. Maybe some of them are not so applied there in Indonesia. Um, Professor uh, Chandra asked me to give uh, something about design. I think we'll have very little time for covering design parameters. But nevertheless, I just put some brief information on some design parameters. I am not sure whether we will be able, be able to cover them. Okay, after the presentation of the processes, I'll make a comparison between them in terms of applicability, in terms of performance, in terms of capacity for removing different types of pollutants. And one important point on my presentation, the focus will be on domestic wastewater, on sewage. I don't have, uh, personal experience on industrial wastewater. I think it's a very broad uh, area for us to cover. So I will concentrate on domestic wastewater. Okay, now, so what uh, is an open access literature on simple methods for wastewater treatment? So I will start with this, which is a, has a very similar title to our presentation today. So uh, it's a two volume book, so a very large one, around 1500 pages. It's entitled Biological Wastewater Treatment in Warm Climate Regions, volumes one and two. I wrote with a, together with a colleague of mine from my university. You can download it, uh, it's open access, you can download it for free in the IWA publishing website. So you have the link here. So these two books, uh, they covered most of the treatment processes I am going to discuss with you today. Okay, these were very large books, 1500 pages. And then some years after that, IWA Publishing decided to split these two big books into smaller ones, and they're called Biological Wastewater Treatment Series. They are basically the same text I showed you before in the two large volumes, but now split into a more general introduction on wastewater characteristics, treatment and disposal. So gives, this gives a general overview. This one gives basic principles of wastewater treatment, the basic unit operations and processes. And then we start with different treatment processes, waste stabilization ponds, anaerobic reactors, activated sludge and aerobic biofilm reactors, sludge treatment and disposal. This, uh, these volumes have been released in 2007, but there was a later addition in 2017, a group from IWA decided to write volume seven of this series, which is called treatment wetlands. I think it is very good because this is a very important process for our conditions. Okay. This is not this one I'm showing you now. It's not exactly 
on design of uh, wastewater treatment plants, but this is a brand new released book. It's more on the evaluation of monitoring data of treatment performance. So you can see assessment of treatment plant performance, either water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, and also water quality data from rivers. It's basically how to uh, structure monitoring programs, how to present your information uh, in terms of descriptive statistics, the best graphic uh, results you, you can use, and then moves into some uh, basic statistics features that are important for analyzing monitoring data, and then moves into some uh, knowledge based uh, on process, which are important for evaluating treatment performance, like mass balances, um, uh, how to obtain kinetic coefficients, and so on and so on. Again, uh, you can download it for free in this link here. Okay, so now moving into the main wastewater treatment processes that can be used in developing countries, and as we highlighted, in warm climate regions. Of course, most of what I will present come from experiences from Brazil, so from my country. So warm climate regions, what are we talking about? Of course, we are talking about Brazil, we are talking about Indonesia, and we are talking about this whole area here uh, covering tropical zones in which we have 1 billion people in tropical zones. So here is Brazil and here is Latin America. I will give some statistics on wastewater treatment in Latin America. And most of my experiences are from Brazil. Of course, we share the same tropical zone here from Indonesia. And if we add subtropical zones here, we have 1.5 billion people living in these areas. So this has important characteristics in the selection and in the design of wastewater treatment processes. Okay, so talking about Latin America, which covers most of Central America and South America. This has been, a, there has been a survey from a, a professor from Mexico and he got information from different countries. What are the major treatment processes that are used in Latin American processes? And the other one will uh, show the statistics in terms of flows. Okay, so here you can see the most widely used treatment process in Latin America are stabilization ponds. They are very important and we will cover them in our presentation. We have different variants here. We have facultative ponds, anaerobic ponds, maturation ponds, and so on. But they are by far the most widely used treatment process. Activated sludge is also widely used in Latin America. I will give some special attention in my presentation to the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors. They are very important for Latin America, and they are especially important for Brazil, as you will see. Uh, I must confess, I am not sure how it is in Indonesia, whether you apply UASB reactors a lot or not. But anyway, you have good conditions because you have warm climates, which, are, uh, which is a special requirement for the utilization of this type of anaerobic reactors. And then we have all the treatment processes, aerated ponds, wetlands, trickling filters, anaerobic filters, and so on. Okay, if we present the same statistics, but now instead of having number of treatment plants per process, we will have the flow in cubic meters per second, these values here, and the percentage that falls in each of these categories. So stabilization pond remain important, but activated sludge is responsible for the largest flow. Of course, because activated sludge is used in the large cities, in our capital cities, and because of that, they treat the wastewater generated by large populations, they, they treat a large flow. And then we have the other treatment processes. Okay, how is the situation in Brazil. 
So this is the specific statistics in Brazil, and this slide will be important because it will guide us in the presentation of what we think are the major wastewater treatment processes that are applied in Brazil and that can also be applied in other warm climate areas in that tropical and subtropical zone <clears throat> I showed you. So stabilization ponds and their different variants, okay, they are also very important in Brazil. You see now here, upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors, either alone, or UASB followed by any form of post-treatment. Why is that? We will see. Because UASB reactors, they don't have a, uh, their capacity is not very high in terms of removal efficiency. Usually they can, they can be adopted alone, but in most of the cases, they will not comply with the discharge standards specified. So with, this, uh, with the quality, of the waste, treated wastewater specified by the legislation. So in this case, normally we need to add a stage that is called post-treatment. Any of these processes here that are used for treating raw wastewater can also be used for post-treatment, the anaerobic effluent. And then we have activated sludge and others. So the core of, of our presentation will lie here. Okay, we will start on stabilization ponds. Very important for our conditions. So facultative ponds, we have many of these facultative ponds in Brazil. They are from the treatment processes. I will show you now. They are the simplest ones to design, to build, and to operate. As a matter of fact, there is not operation, there is more maintenance because there is, more, there is nothing that the operator can do in order to change the operation. So it's basically maintenance. So this is a large bond system we have here in Brazil, but we have many of them, as you saw. I imagine that also in Indonesia, when you apply stabilization bonds, weather permitting in, in the locations in which weather allows this, so they're basically the influent flow enters from one side, leaves from the other side during this hydraulic retention time, which is around 20, 30, 40 days, depending on the climatic conditions. You have a lot of reactions occur. Organic matter is consumed by bacteria. Bacteria do the respiration, consume oxygen, and the oxygen comes from photosynthesis. Algae will do photosynthesis, produce oxygen, and then have a mutualistic relationship with the bacteria. Uh, since the uh, stabilization ponds, they are such a large reactor, the sludge produced, it's important to remember, all biological wastewater treatment processes produce sludge. But in this case, this sludge, the biological solids that are produced, they go to the bottom of the pond and they remain there for 20 years or even more without the need for removal. So very simple, as you can see, the construction is very simple. In terms of design criteria, there are advanced design criteria. I just put here, this table here, we will not have time to discuss about the values, but just as a reminder, the first thing we calculate when we design facultative ponds is the required surface area. And we use the concept of organic surface loading. So BOD loading rates uh, in terms of kilograms of BOD per hectare of surface area per day. Depending on the climate you have, this is for our regions, okay? So if you have warm winter, you can apply a higher loading rate. So each hectare of surface area can receive a higher BOD load between 240 to 350 kilograms per day. If you have a cold winter and low sunshine, you can apply a lower area, a lower load per unit area. In other words, to treat the same wastewater load, you will require larger areas. 
This is for our climatic conditions, but we, we can also apply bond, uh, facultative bonds in temperate climate countries. And then the design criteria are even more stringent. The applied load rate, loading rate is lower than that. Okay, if you like the bond systems, you want to use facultative bonds, but you need to decrease your surface area, you can put an anaerobic bond ahead. So here we can see three li lines in parallel. Each line has one anaerobic bond followed by a facultative bond. The anaerobic bond will remove something between 50 to 60% of the incoming BOD, meaning that if you remove say 60% here, it means that you will design your facultative bond for only 40% of your BOD load, and then you decrease the required size. But pay attention, now we have an open anaerobic reactor, which is subject to the release of malodorous if the anaerobic bonds are not operating well. So that's a concern we have. So this is why we have to be distant from the nearest houses because of problems of bad smell. So you need an empty area around it in order not to have problems of complaints from the neighborhood. Okay, if you want to include one additional treatment objective, you have already removed most of your organic matter, but you want to remove something else. What? Pathogenic organisms. Then you can incorporate what is called the maturation ponds. Here we see a top view from the largest system we have here in Brazil. These are, uh, this is one anaerobic pond, facultative pond. So this is enough for removing BOD. You can see how large the, uh, it is because these here are the blocks, very small houses and so on. Each of these here has one kilometer in length by around 300 uh, meters of width. Okay, and then you add an additional ponds working in series and they will be responsible for the removal of the four categories of pathogenic organisms we have. Pathogenic bacteria, viruses, protozoan cysts, and helminth eggs, producing an effluent that does not need to be discharged on this small river here. It can be used for irrigation according to the World Health Organization guidelines. Okay, I told you that in Brazil, we use a lot UASB reactors. Here is a system uh, that involves UASB and ponds it's for 60,000 uh, population equivalents. You can see the anaerobic reactors are very small. They are very compact and then they required a polishing stage. In this case, by a series of ponds, different configurations with baffles, very elongated, followed by coarse filters. This produces an effluent with very good quality. But we have to notice here, the required area is very large if you compare it with a UASB reactor. So a lot of effort in terms of land requirements. So this is a table for you to look later on, uh, making a comparison between the major systems we saw now in terms of removal efficiency, in terms of land requirements. Removal efficiencies, we will talk about uh, uh, later on, but you can see POD removal efficiencies in all these variants are around 80%. We cannot expect much more than this. This is inherent to the simple process of stabilization ponds. So that's the typical uh, efficiency we are going to get. In our climatic conditions, the land requirements will vary. For instance, between two and four square meters per inhabitant. For facultative ponds, if you use anaerobic ponds, the total area will decrease a bit, but still a large area. And if you incorporate maturation ponds, 
you will require very large areas, but then you are able to have very high removal efficiency of coliforms or in general of pathogenic organisms between 99.9 .9 up to 99.9999. In other words, between three up to six log units uh, of reduction. Okay, constructed wetlands. This is uh, increasing in Brazil and some other countries in Latin America are more advanced than us, but it is hugely employed in North America and in Europe. And I think it has a tremendous scope for our climatic conditions. Here is a simple uh, division of the main types of constructed wetlands. We have surface flow wetlands, different variants. They are basically like ponds with plants. And I'm going to cover here very briefly only this here, which is the main type of treatment wetlands we have, subsurface flow, in which the water level of wastewater is below the level of the supporting medium, the gravel, for instance. We have horizontal flow wetlands and vertical flow wetlands. Okay, this is an example of horizontal flow wetlands. This is a picture from our experimental site, so it's treating from our, our university and our sanitation company here. It treats real wastewater for a population of 50 inhabitants here, 50 inhabitants there. Um, it takes about 1.5 square meters per inhabitant. So this is basically a filter. This is a filter with a horizontal filter without plants. The level of the wastewater is below the surface here, you don't see anything. And here's a filter with plants. So that's the actual wetland. We need plants to call them wetland. So they are beautiful as they are here, but as time passes year after year, solids will start to accumulate here and then increasing the head loss. And eventually, after some years, you can get clogging and you can have water flowing on the surface of your wetland. This has happened with our systems here because they are operating for many years. This here is a variant I like very much. It's called the vertical flow wetlands French system. So it's the French that conceived this system. And in France, they have more than 4,000 of these units here treating mainly sewage from small communities. Basically, uh, it's very simple. So there is no mechanical equipment. You feed, uh, can be a siphon using a siphon. You have three filters in parallel. They are vertical filters. Okay, you have three in parallel. Each time you feed one of the filters and the others are resting for some days. Then after some days you change, you feed this one. This one is in operation. This one starts to rest and so on. This alternation is very important. This is the so-called first stage responsible for a very good removal of BOD, COD, total suspended solids, and even partial removal of ammonia. And the second stage is similar. It is to improve even further the removal efficiencies. Another important point, besides alternating the feeding the unit, the filter that is in operation, receives the wastewater, not conti continuously, but it is fed in batches, in pulses. So every, say, two hours comes one batch of wastewater from this storage tank here. It comes and feeds the unit, the liquid percolates, and so on. Then you wait another two hours. And all of this happens very quickly. Very good system, very simple. Here is a picture in our research unit. We're treating here uh, the wastewater from around 100 inhabitants using more or less one square meter per inhabitant. Okay, typical removal efficiencies. Uh, I would say different variants here, horizontal flow, vertical flow, French system. In terms of BOD and uh, suspended solids, 
good removal efficiency is around 90% we could expect in terms of ammonia and nitrogen removal, the horizontal units are not very efficient, but the vertical units, because of this operation in pulses, the liquid passes, and after the liquid passes, the open space between the gravel, so the void spaces, the pore spaces are filled with air, oxygen. Then you can have nitrification, ammonia removal. Okay, now UASB reactors and post-treatment. So this is very, very important here in Brazil. So Brazil is the country in the world that is applying more uh, anaerobic technology for sewage treatment and also post-treatment. So you can he see here that we use UASB reactors for very small installations. This is for a few hundred inhabitants up to very large, so thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, coming up into 1 million inhabitants. That's a treatment plant we have in my city here of Belo Horizonte. You can see that the height here is more or less the same. What varies is this total surface area, of course, the volume, but the height is more or less the same, the depth is the same, so the area will vary. So this is a very large installation. Um, very briefly, how does it work? So the, it is an upflow reactor. So wastewater comes from the bottom, it reaches and gets contact with the biomass, which is in the form of a sludge blanket, a sludge bed. So anaerobic organisms here, they are responsible for removing anaerobically the organic matter. And then the liquid with less wastewater, the effluent moves upwards and the effluent leaves from here. Okay, these uh, brown dots here, sorry, I'll start with the white ones. These are bubbles of gas. There's anaerobic digestion taking place here, bubbles of gas. If these bubbles enter this compartment here, they would affect the sedimentation of the solids. We want good sedimentation of solids here. And then we have this, what is called a tri-phase separator. So three phases, gas, solids, liquid. It collects the gas and you can use the gas later on. It separates the solids and the solids will settle well here and will return to this part of your reactor retaining the solids, avoiding that your effluent has many solids and also retaining important biomass. So this is, is a, a high rate process because it is able to keep the biomass. Typical removal efficiencies are not high, as I had told you. So they are around 60, 70% in terms of BOD and COD, but they are very compact. They are designed for domestic wastewater based on hydraulic retention time. Under our climatic conditions, something between six to nine hours. So on average, I would say eight hours. So they are very compact reactors. These are the typical heights between four and five, and five meters, okay? This is a view of that large installation I told you 1 million inhabitants, these is UASB reactors, and then the post-treatment, in this case here, is using trickling filters. Trickling filters are a very simple wastewater treatment process. They don't have any large mechanical equipment. Okay, they have the rotating arm distributor, but this does not consume energy, and it's a, very, it's a relatively simple equipment. It's not that cheap, in terms of equipment, but it is very simple to operate. And then here's the system we have. These are the design criteria for treatment filters after UASB reactors. They are designed based on organic loading rates, volumetric organic loading rates. So what volume do we need to treat a certain BOD load? Um, okay, they are able to remove well uh, organic matter and suspended solids, but with this applied organic loading rates, they are not very efficient for removing ammonia. We would need much larger 
trickling filters. Okay, can activated sludge be used as a post-treatment? Yes. Here I'm showing you an example in a nearby city here, near to my uh, city of Belo Horizonte. This is treating uh, a population of 370,000 uh, inhabitants, UASB reactors, and then we have the activated sludge post-treatment stage. And that's it, very uh, good removal efficiency. This plant here was given more than 90% BOD removal efficiency. These are, I will skip this table here. Okay, just now short summary comparison between these treatment processes. So what is their capacity of these various treatment processes for removing BOD, ammonia, nitrogen, phosphorus, and also pathogens. Okay, starting with BOD, why? Because most of our wastewater treatment plants are designed for the removal of organic matter. So for BOD or COD removal. In this scale here, we can see low efficiencies, starting with 70%, then moving upwards 80, 90, 98. We have ranges of treatment processes covering all of these efficiencies. As I told you, USB reactors are in this range here of lower efficiency. But if they incorporate any type of post-treatment, the efficiency will move up. So we have here stabilization ponds is slightly higher efficiency. Wetlands, as I told you, is like the higher. Trickling filters, more or less uh, compatible here. USB reactors followed by any form of post-treatment. The overall efficiency will depend on what type of post-treatment we are using. And of course, we have more advanced treatment process as moving bed bioreactors, uh, membrane processes, and so on and so on. Okay, for ammonia removal, now the range of possibilities decreases. Activated sludge and submerged aerated biofilters, okay. Uh, they are good for ammonia removal. Full nitrification is expected. But they do not remove total nitrogen in the way they are. They convert ammonia into nitrate. The nitrogen is still there. Trickling filter, as I told you, uh, if you use rocks, stones, gravel uh, as packing media, the nitrification capacity will not be high. You will achieve only partial nitrification. But if you use plastic media with larger surface areas, then you can have, you can approach full nitrification. Vertical wetlands, as I told you, they are good for removing ammonia. And also maturation ponds, there are very mechanisms that work together for the removal of ammonia. Nitrogen in terms of uh, biological me uh, removal uh, mechanisms, we have very few processes. Activated sludge with BNR, biological nutrient removal. They are more complex to operate. They need one, an, uh, an anoxic zone, aerobic zone, but maturation ponds are still a simple process and is still capable for nitrogen re removal, but requires a very large area. For phosphorus removal, very few processes. Here again, activated sludge with biological nutrient removal. In this case, we need to remove organic matter, nitrogen, and if we want to remove phosphorus, we need one anaerobic zone here, so uh, the flow moves from here, enters here, makes a curve here, and leaves here. This is an anaerobic zone, an anoxic zone without oxygen, with nitrate, aerobic zone with diffuser air aerations, one internal recirculation here, pumping nitrate into the anoxic zone. So very complex to operate, very efficient, but very complex. Fortunately for phosphorus, uh, we do not depend only on biological process. We can add chemicals and induce precipitation of phosphorus with chemical salts. So that's a possibility you can see here, the addition of chemicals. Okay, for pathogen removal, it depends on what type of pathogen we're talking about. 
pathogenic bacteria and viruses are, removal, are removed by, let's say, decay inactivation mechanisms and protozoan, which are present in the form of cysts, and helminths, worms, which are present in the form of eggs, they are removed by physical means. So in ponds, they can settle. So that's one possibility. And so here, the maturation ponds, they are able to remove the four categories. Of course, you can have one disinfection stage, chlorination, chlorination followed by dechlorination, ultraviolet radiation, ozone, and so on. And also, we need to mention, we can have a physical barrier, like membranes. So nothing will pass through the membranes. Even pathogenic bacteria can be retained. OK. So again, trying to summarize what we saw. So expected removal efficiencies from these major wastewater treatment processes that we use in our climatic conditions. This is a personal interpretation, but of course, based on literature, based on experience, on monitoring data, etc. I will present only some schematic graphs uh, and all of them, they will have like this. Uh, if it is yellow, it's just UASB reactor. If it is green, it is a natural treatment system, extensive, ponds, wetlands, and so on. If it's blue, it is a compact, intensive system, activated sludge, trickling filter. And so USB reactor, uh, followed by something. And then if it incorporates additional steps like disinfection, biological nutrient removal, and so on. So let's come back again. BOD. Here I listed some processes. I will not discuss each of them individually. I will just make a general analysis. Uh, here is removal efficiency. I considered low removal efficiency of BOD if they are lower than 70%. I considered intermediate removal efficiency if they are between 70% and 85%, and high removal efficiencies, if they are between 85 and 100%. The main message I would like to pass here is that, okay, USB reactors alone will give uh, small efficiency, low efficiency. And then most of the treatment processes will be in this range between intermediate and high efficiencies. And the natural treatment processes are capable of giving similar removal efficiencies at the more intensive ones. This is important. So we, we could think, well, natural treatment process, they are very simple. They are not efficient. No, they can give similar removal efficiencies. OK, coming back to ammonia. Uh, now the division of low efficiency, intermediate and high, I put it like that. If it's less than 35%, I call it low removal efficiency of ammonia between 35 and 70% intermediate, and higher than 70% high removal efficiency. Now you see a complete scatter. So there are some processes, and most of them are able to give only low removal efficiencies or intermediate removal efficiencies. Fortunately, we have some processes that are able to give high removal efficiencies, like activated sludge, aerated biofilters, vertical wetlands. But see, the number of possibilities decreases. If we are talking about removing total nitrogen, so all forms of nitrogen, most of the treatment processes will lie in between the low removal efficiency range. Low starting to be intermediate. Very few processes are capable of achieving high removal efficiency. I put here, for instance, you uh, activated sludge with biological nutrient removal. Okay, so it's not easy to remove total nitrogen. Something similar in terms of phosphorus. Most of the treatment processes that we use are capable of giving only a low removal efficiency of phosphorus. And natural treatment systems and intensive treatment systems have a similar capacity in terms of phosphorus removal. If we want high removal efficiencies, we need to put biological uh, nutrient removal after activated sludge, 
we can also apply uh, USB followed by flotation, precipitation of phosphorus, or any treatment process, for instance, USB followed by post-treatment, followed by chemical precipitation. When it comes to pathogen removal, using Scherichia coli as indicator, we are representing here in terms of log units removal, so log units reduction. One log unit reduction is equal to 90%, two is equal to 99, 99.9, 99.99, and so on. We can see here a difference between natural systems and intensive uh, systems, compact systems. Why is that? Because in the compact systems, the hydraulic retention time is very small. There is less time for the decay of bacteria or pathogenic bacteria or the indicator uh, Escherichia coli. Uh, there are no uh, important mechanisms forcing this decay. But we, if we apply natural treatment systems, usually because they are larger, they are exposed to the environment, the removal efficiency will be high. And of course, if we apply maturation ponds, we are able to achieve very, very high removal efficiencies, five log units, for instance, 99.999 removal efficiency. And of course, if you apply uh, any treatment like this and include a disinfection stage or a barrier like a membrane, you are able to achieve whatever efficiency uh, you require. Okay, so coming to the end of our presentation, the concluding remarks. That's the question that we are always asked. People are always discussing. What is the best wastewater treatment process? I think that we saw from this presentation that there is no best treatment process. Each of them is site specific. Each of them is important. We have to be open to different alternatives. It is very good that we have many choices. We saw here many possibilities for sewage treatment. So it is very important that we, uh, at the universities, in the curriculum of civil engineering, chemical engineering, environmental engineering, we are able to learn about the capability of each of these treatment processes, uh, also the applicability for us to be able in each location we are, to always be able to select the best treatment process. So there is no standard solution that will be applied to every location. So the uh, stage of conceptual uh, design is very important. What treatment process will I use? So we have many choices. And I think that's a very important message for Brazil and I guess also for Indonesia. We have to move on a stepwise manner. Here in Brazil, we have a huge deficit in terms of wastewater treatment. We cannot solve everything from one day to the other, from one year to the other. We cannot apply the most sophisticated treatment processes to remove together BOD, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, pathogenic organisms we have to analyze case by case and give priorities to each of them on a case by case basis. And also we have to be open to new opportunities. In my presentation here, I talk a lot about removal, 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 but we have to think about recovery. Some of the things that we always thought about removing, nowadays we think about recovery. So we can recover the phosphorus, uh, and use the phosphorus, uh, it's, it's a very important uh, commodity. Uh, we can treat the wastewater and reuse the water for agricultural purposes, for urban uh, utilization and so on. So that's the new focus on wastewater treatment and we need to live with this new approach and it is a very important one. But anyway, it's a lot, but we have to move on a stepwise manner. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be available for discussions here. I emphasize again 
that it has been a pleasure for me to share this with you. I'm willing to see the discussion and I would appreciate if you also are able to bring your very important experience in Indonesia for us to be able uh, to have this discussion. So thank you very much. I return to Professor Chandra uh, for conducting the rest of the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcos. Probably you have to take a rest first. So uh, I will just uh, briefly uh, uh, summarize your talk in Bahasa Indonesia. So it may be some of them did not uh, follow quite clearly. So I will talk for a few minutes. Yes. Just take a rest first for you. Uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian, tadi uh, Profesor Marcos sudah menyampaikan uh, uh, apa, uh, beberapa teknologi. Memang uh, Profesor Marcos membicarakannya uh, kepada sistem-sistem yang uh, banyak dipakai di uh, Brasil. Ya, jadi uh, tadi sudah uh, banyak contoh-contoh yang uh, digunakan. Nah, memang kita paham bahwa di dalam pengolahan limbah uh, domestik uh, kan mulai dari yang sangat simpel tadi dengan pond dengan sistem ponding system, kemudian memang ada satu lagi adalah yang sangat kompleks atau yang uh, banyak di negara maju yaitu sistem lumpur aktif atau activated sludge. Ya, bahkan ada yang MBBR dan mungkin ada sistem uh, membran juga. Nah, mungkin uh, ini di, di antara itu. Jadi, jadi tadi jadi ada yang menggunakan UISB, kemudian menggabungkan UISB itu dengan sistem uh, yang lainnya, kemudian membicarakan juga dengan uh, wetland, uh, kemudian juga uh, tadi sangat baik sekali bagaimana kalau yang uh, uh, BUD, uh, nitrogen, fosforus dan kemudian kalau mau ke uh, menghilangkan patogen itu pilihan teknologinya uh, apa saja. Jadi tadi sangat uh, sangat baik sekali Profesor Marcos mengatakan bahwa tidak ada uh, satu sistem yang apa ya yang terbaik gitu. Masing-masing ada plus ada minusnya. Ya, jadi masing-masing ada plus minusnya uh, tergantung kita mau uh, apa melihat harus mempertimbangkan dengan baik. Nah mungkin uh, Beta, uh, uh, apakah ada pertanyaan yang bisa di share? Tapi, tapi mungkin sebelum pertanyaan uh, dari dari Floor, uh, saya ingin bertanya ke saya aja ke Profesor Marcos. Uh, Marcos, yes. so uh, Brazil is in new examples uh, a lot of uh, is uh, use using the centralized system. So that, that one is just how the decentralized system also uh, has been developed in the uh, Brazil. Or, or what is the, 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 the uh, what, uh, how to choose between the centralized and then centralized system in your opinion? Yes, thank you Chandra. That's a very important point. Uh, I, I showed most of large treatment systems here but it doesn't mean that we can only apply these systems for large ones. So they can apply it for this, uh, in the decentralized context for small mm. communities, okay? Mm. Especially the natural treatment systems. So stabilization ponds, wetlands, um, USB reactors as well, but maybe for very small ones, uh, septic tanks would be easier than UASB reactors. Okay, so that's the level of decentralization that I mentioned, treating the wastewater from small populations, even coming to the rural areas in which you have small populations. Okay, but in terms of decentralized on-site sanitations, I didn't show anything. I only showed wastewater treatment for communities, small, medium, and large communities. But of course we have on-site uh, systems in Brazil, yeah. they yeah. account for a very important percentage, uh, especially in the, for instance, in the Amazon area, they prevail because the, it's very difficult to have the conventional network of sewage collection. And that what preva prevails mainly in rural areas, but they are not very common in the urban areas, especially in the middle 
to large cities. In middle to large cities, mostly use the conventional sewerage system. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But if if we if we are choosing, uh, what is uh, the concept? If, for example, if you would like to choose the uh, decentralized system and the centralized system, what will be the 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 thing we have to consider? Uh, uh, we would like if, if some uh, a part of the city willing to develop either it is a centralized system or decentralized system. So what will be uh, we have to consider uh, choosing uh, the system? Okay, I think it will depend on the uh, water and sanitation company that will operate the system. Um, most of them, they do not work very much with uh, combined systems. But anyway, it is a possibility. In some part of the city, in a certain basin or catchment area, uh, which is a, in which you have a high population density, you can apply centralized systems. Mm. If your population density is smaller, but it's still in the urban area, you can apply decentralized, coming even to on-site uh, solutions. Yeah. But I would say okay. that in, in most of the uh, medium to large cities we have here, we tend to use centralized systems and the decentralization is not very uh, high. It depends only on the catchment areas you have. So having, say, I would say four, five, six uh, sewage mm -hmm. treatment plants, depending on the topography. So uh, coming back to your question, I yeah. think it depends very much on populational density. And mm -hmm. if it comes to decentralization on-site solutions, it depends very yeah. much on what yeah. the population wants, because the population need to be part in the selection procedure. Okay. okay, thank you. So thank you, Marco. So that one is a uh, the question coming up from uh, from the particip participant. So uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Usman. So you are mentioned about the membrane as the barrier. Uh, yes. Where is the appropriate place uh, to put the membrane? So that one is a uh, it is in the pond or or how 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 is it to use the membrane? Uh, as a barrier. Okay, I think a, a good system, which is being uh, very widely applied, not so much for a, a sewage in Brazil, but mainly for industrial wastewater, and also in, in other countries, especially more developed countries, are membrane bioreactors. So you combine them uh, with an activated sludge, for instance. So you have your aeration tank, Activated sludge, you, you have an mm. aeration tank and you have your sedimentation tank. So this is sedimentation tank is the solids liquid separation unit. Instead of having the sedimentation tank, you have a membrane, physical barrier. So you retain all the solids, the biological solids, they are important because you keep the biological solids in the system. You can have compact systems. So you have all the biochemical reactions to remove organic matter, uh, DCOD, ammonia, and so on. And also, because you have membranes, it depends on the uh, type of membranes. Uh, if you're using ultrafiltration, uh, nanofiltration, and so on. But depending on the um, spacing between the membranes, then you are able to remove biological solids and also pathogenic organisms. And, and in membrane bioreactors, there are... Uh, some situations in which you put the membranes outside the aeration tanks, and in other cases, they are inside the aeration tanks. Thank you. So that one is the the uh, the other question. I think so. Uh, uh, Zul Adri asking about uh, what is the difference between an aerobic pond and a facultative pond. So what is the difference? I mean, in terms of design or in terms of how they have the works with an anaerobic pond and then facultative pond. Okay, good question. Uh, I didn't have much time to cover it, but anyway, uh, facultative ponds, they are large ponds because they need large surface areas. Why do they require large surface areas? For sunlight to penetrate. With sunlight energy, algae 
are able to do the photosynthesis. And by doing the photosynthesis, they produce the oxygen that will be used by the bacteria that will feed on the organic matter from the sewage, BOD and COD. So facultative ponds are like these large surface areas. Their typical depth is between 1.5 to 2 meters. Okay, you can have shallower, you can have slightly deeper, but most of them are between 1.5 to 2 meters. The anaerobic pond is more compact, has less volume, less hydraulic retention time, but most importantly, less surface area. Then sunlight uh, energy does not penetrate so much because the available surface area is small. You don't have much photosynthesis. Also very important, anaerobic ponds, they are deeper, mm -hmm. five meters for instance, and then the oxygen that could be produced by photosynthesis in the top layer where the algae could be, does not diffuse and does not get mixed, yeah. does not penetrate into the deeper layers. So that's a, a major distinction. In anaerobic ponds, we have mainly anaerobic organisms. And it, they, it has to be under these conditions. Otherwise, if one anaerobic pond oscillates between anaerobic conditions and aerobic conditions, mm. this will be lethal, fatal for the anaerobic organisms, especially mm. the methanogenic organisms, because they do not resist to this condition. They will die. You have problems of bad smell, poor removal efficiency, and so on. So either you have facultative ponds, large ones, or small ones, anaerobic ponds. And of mm. course, the combination of both. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. So uh, that one is from Noor uh, asking that uh, you, you have uh, shown that, that uh, the removal efficiency for uh, different parameters. So is there any correlation? I mean, so is there any correlation between each parameter, the removal efficiency? Is there any correlation uh, for each technology? Okay. Um, I would say, for instance, there is a good correlate, a relatively good correlation between suspended solids and BOD or COD, because part of the organic matter that lives in the effluent from, from most treatment processes is in the form of suspended solids, particulate BOD, particulate COD. And then if we have a treatment process that removes very well suspended solids. This means that it will remove very well particulate POD and particulate COD. We were talking about membranes one minute ago. If you have a membrane, your effluent does not have any suspended solids. You will have only soluble organic matter, okay? So suspended solids gives a relatively good correlation with particulate BOD and particulate COD. But besides that, not very much, because each of these uh, pollutants is removed by different mechanisms. So you can have an excellent treatment process that removes very well organic matter, but is not capable of removing ammonia or is not capable mm -hmm. of removing nitrogen. So I think there is no uh, correlation at all. Oh yes, a final correlation between suspended solids and of course, also bacteria, uh, pathogenic bacteria and coliforms. If you have a very well clarified effluent, this means that you have removed well suspended solids. Coliforms are also suspended solids. So you could have <clears throat> some uh, relationship. But anyway, variability is very high. Mm. I would not even call it correlation. I would say there is a relationship, mm. could have a relationship between them, okay? Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, from Fausan, uh, so that uh, you have mentioned about the wide uh, variety of the uh, treatment method. Uh, is there any possibility that treating uh, the system, uh, not only treating the household, but using for the industrial Wastewater, or 
combined between industrial and also the household. Is there okay. any possibility? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, there is, uh, because these biological treatment processes I showed you can also be used for treating we uh, industrial wastewater, provided the industrial wastewater has organic matter, has biodegradable organic matter. So depending on the uh, processing of the industry, so if it is a dairy industry, a beverage industry, a slaughterhouse, a cannery, uh, and, and so on and so on, that produces effluents with lots of organic matter, you can use these uh, biological treatment systems. <clears throat> if you have an industry that does not produce an effluent with organic matter, but with metals, with non-biodegradable uh, components and so on, the biological treatment will help you very little. And okay, you can also use a combination. Some cities mm -hmm. in the urban area, they also receive industrial wastewater. If the industries are nearby, they can discharge their effluent into the public network collection system and the combined uh, sanitary or domestic wastewater and the industrial wastewater is treated together. But this will depend on the location of the industry and the industry needs to remove uh, before. If the industrial effluent has toxic compounds, heavy mm. metals, okay. yes. discharge yes. things that uh, can uh, cause problems in the network, problems with the safety of the operators, they have to be removed. Okay, and uh, coming to the question of the households, yes, but I showed mainly uh, processes for communities. Mm. Some of them can be applied for households, but most of them not. So I would not use USB reactors, strictly filters, activated sludge for household uh, wastewater, even ponds, because mm. ponds for each household, they are an open surface. We can have children playing around in the household. They can get contaminated with the open wastewater. I could use uh, some subsurface wetlands that could be applied and also other processes that I didn't show, septic tanks, infiltration on ground and so on. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Marcos. Thank you. So, uh, is there, I think there's an, another, okay. Uh, that one is, is already shown, so, but I yes. think the, the other question is uh, uh, regarding the filter, an aerobic filter and then uh, aerobic filter. Uh, what is the media use uh, for the uh, for the treatment, uh, especially in in case in Brazil? What what is the media use for the filter? Either it is aerobic filter or or might be also uh, in the case of an aerobic filter. Okay, so uh, for anaerobic filters, uh, we have many of these systems. I didn't even show them in my presentation they are not performing well. So we could have septic tanks followed by anaerobic filters. And it's important to mention that it is different from the upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors I showed you. In the UASB reactors, you do not ha have any packing media, okay? You just have the liquid and the biomass, anaerobic biomass and so on. So there's no packing media. For anaerobic filters, you also have an upflow uh, movement of the wastewater and you have the packing medium, mainly stones or gravel. Mm. When it comes to trickling filters, and then trickling filters are full aerobic. So mm. the wastewater, it's a, a downflow uh, travel, uh, the liquid percolates. So it's different from the anaerobic filter which is a submerged reactor. The water level is high. In the anaerobic filter, the water level is in the bottom. So the liquid just is uh, discharged on top of the filter and it simply percolates around the stones, gravel or plastic media. So you can buy specifically uh, made plastic media in which you have a very large surface area. We are uh, reproducing here some very good experiences from Japan, uh, which is called the, you can have so-called sponge bed reactors. So instead of having 
stones or even plastic media, you have some curtains with stones. They have a very high surface area and they are very light. So a lot of bacteria can grow in the inner parts of these sponges and you have, can have, then in this case, you can have very good nitrification, okay? So there are people producing this type of uh, sponge for using in treatment filters. Okay, that one is a Professor Harada, right? <laughs> That's yes, Harada, you know him, yes, exactly, yes. 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 <laughs> uh, yes, for sure. Uh, so that one is uh, from uh, Alifa. Uh, of, of course, it, it is really in Jawa Islands, where it's very, very uh, dense uh, population in, in, in Jawa Islands. So the land availability is a, is a crucial one. So what will be uh, your suggestion for the, the, the where the the land is quite scarce, and which technology you 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 like to uh, you you think it is a uh, suitable for the land if the space is uh, limited. Okay, that's a good uh, point. And for using ponds, definitely we need space, and not only space. We need uh, a good topography. It cannot be very hilly area. Ideally, it is uh, should be flat. And we also need a good soil because most of the costs involved in constructing stabilization ponds are related to earth movements. So cutting, uh, digging, transporting, getting good soil from other places, putting a clay ceiling in the bottom, uh, clay lining in the bottom of the pond. So this can be very costly. So we always think ponds are very cheap. Okay, they can be cheap if you're land is cheap, your soil is good, your topography is good. Otherwise, the costs will increase very much. Then you would think in terms of using more compact systems. Mm -hmm. If you have no land or if your land is not good. I think the uh, UASB reactors, they are very important. So he, here in Brazil, we have been able to prove that, okay, they have problems as all other wastewater treatment processes have, they will require some operation, but not sophisticated operation, and they are very compact. So if we need to think in terms of simplicity and a system that does not consume energy, I think UASB reactors are a very good solution. I would say from populations starting from 500 inhabitants upwards for very small installations, I think they would be complex for very small communities. So better to use septic tank followed by some form of post-treatment. But Chandra, I'm very curious. Do you have UASB reactors in Indonesia? Yes, are, yes. Are that, so that one is uh, in the YouTube uh, mentioning about this one. So in Indonesia, there is, there is uh, some USB uh, reactor has been uh, in place, but it's uh, not functioning very well. So, so uh, that's, that's uh, coming from uh, the YouTube. So uh, why that, that, that uh, the reason for some of the USB not functioning well? Okay, something similar happened in Brazil and it, it, it is still happening. <clears throat> there is a lot of controversy and there are many people who do not like USB reactors especially because of this problem. So when we started using USB reactors in Brazil, it was in the 80s. And then in the 90s, we increased the number of USB reactors. Of course, there were operational problems, especially bad odors, release of hydrogen sulfide. So there was huge complaints, corrosion problems as well. Okay. Brazil invested a lot in research on anaerobic reactors, on USB reactors. So lots of universities during, during years and years together with water and sanitation companies doing research, developing design criteria. I think now we are comfortable in having reliable design criteria, but of course we still have some challenges. The question of order which is very important, there are some means in which you can collect your biogas 
and you can treat the biogas in order to remove the odors. Corrosion is also a problem. Above the, the liquid level, you can have corrosion in the upper uh, part of your reactor. You can now, a lot of research, you can use construction materials that are more resistant. You can uh, either uh, can use stainless steel, of course, it's very expensive. <clears throat> uh, steel with a protective coating can be good. Fiberglass for small plants, fiberglass has no problems with corrosion, but uh, if you are using concrete, you need to have a very good concrete, a very good coverage. Uh, you have to cover very well the iron inside the concrete. We can also have problems related to scum. So a lot of scum accumulates on top of your reactor. And this is scum, your reactor is closed. Mm. You have to find some means of removing this scum. In some treatment plants, the reactors did not allow removal of scum and then it mm. got accumulated there and it destroyed that gas liquid solids separate, okay? And then finally, uh, we also need a, a good preliminary treatment. Mm. Good sand removal, because sand cannot accumulate inside anaerobic reactors. And ideally, in the preliminary treatment, using not, not only coarse uh, screens, medium screens, but also using sieves that removes in the preliminary uh, treatment most of the uh, solids that could lead to the formation of scum. Okay. Uh, this is why it's not so simple for very small communities. But yeah. if you have from 500 population equivalents upwards, okay, you can handle these. So in, uh, so that, uh, in which book uh, you cover about the USB, USB okay. design and operation? Uh, in that series of books, if I remember well, I think it's either volume four or volume five. It's entirely dedicated to anaerobic reactors, okay? Mm. And uh, so th this is the open access book. But very recently, last year, uh, the colleague of mine who is also co-author of the other books, Carlos Kernicaro, he published okay. an updated book on anaerobic reactors also by IWA Publishing. It's very comprehensive and it discusses uh, how to solve these problems. But this book is not open access, but it's very good, very comprehensive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So that, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, about the, the, the from Irianto, uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, the, of course you have the populated uh, area. Uh, how you, how the, the installation in densely uh, populated area uh, in, in Brazil as a common? Probably you have answered the question, Professor, but probably you can address this one uh, shortly. Yes, okay. So in most of the highly densely populated areas, we're using centralized systems because it would be very costly to use on-site solutions. Uh, and then that's the traditional way we have the network of uh, collecting sewage. In Brazil, we tend to use the separate sewage system. So we separate sewage in one network and rainwater, storm water in a separate drainage system. So we convey only sewage in the separate network. The sewage goes into the treatment plants. In most of the cases, the densely populated areas uh, okay, you will need to, you don't have much land available. You will need to use more compact systems, as I told you, USB reactors, followed by any form of compact systems, especially here in Brazil. <clears throat> what is being most widely used in, in terms of compact systems is USB reactors followed by trickling filters. We have many of them, and also it's a very good choice for the rest of Latin America as well. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I, I'm trying to understand the, the green question. <laughs> it's the contradiction between each technology. So, one of the methods, one of the technology will make other parameters higher. Mm, I'm not 
quite sure to get yeah. this uh, this question. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, not sure as well. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, we have to think in terms of what are <clears throat> the main mechanisms that take place in each of the technologies. Because, for instance, as I told you, uh, fa po facultative points followed by maturation points are very, very simple. But we have mechanisms in the maturation points for removing pathogenic bacteria and viruses by decay mechanisms in activation. We also have physical mechanisms, sedimentation for removing protozoan cysts and helminth eggs. So they live together. But for instance, uh, maybe I understood a, a bit better. For instance, one anaerobic reactor in terms of contradiction. Uh, we can remove organic matter with anaerobic organisms, but we are not capable of removing ammonia because the, by nitrification because the traditional nitrification requires aerobic conditions. So yeah, yeah, this yeah. could be a contradiction. But if yeah. you have start with an aerobic and then continue as a post-treatment with an aerobic stage, you can get the best of both worlds together. OK. OK, then uh, so that one is the regarding the ABR and uh, anaerobic buffer reactor. So you did not mention uh, anything about the ABR. ABR. Uh, is there any problem with this uh, technology, or uh, what for the reason that you did not say any anything about the ABR? Uh, ABR. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's interesting because they are not so popular here in Brazil. I like very much the concept. I think it's a good reactor. It's simple. It's better than the conventional septic tank, and mm. it is simpler than the UASB reactor. It has been applied in some situations, but maybe because Brazil invested so much in the UASB yeah. reactors, right, right. they became more popular. Yeah. But I agree that they are so widely used. Maybe in Indonesia, they are very widely used. Yes, yes, they are very yes. yeah. yeah, of course, uh, because you are from the, the London. So David, David Stucky is uh, working on the AVR, right? So one of the... Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so you're... <laughs> Yeah, but in Indonesia, that's a lot of the uh, uh, ABR mm. actually for the decentralized uh, system. I see. Okay. Good. So, uh, uh, by the way, because uh, here is uh, we are already uh, goes because uh, in the in the in the in the prayer time. So I think so we have to conclude uh, our session with because we are already uh, coming to the uh, prayer time here. <laughs> So, uh, but is there is still, uh, or I think she's already uh, 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 up to the time. So we have to close and we have to conclude. And then, uh, but uh, Marcos will uh, stay for a while. We will take a picture together. Uh, Veta, for me, you can close, uh, you can close okay. the session. Veta. Okay. 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 Uh, so uh, due to time constraints, we must end this last session now. So we want to thank you to Prof. Marcos, who has shared his knowledge so well, and hopefully his uh, knowledge can help us in doing real processing in Indonesia, so Indonesia can be more sustainable in our processing our wastewater. And we want to thank you, Professor Chandra, who has guided us in scientific discussion today. And uh, uh, thank you so much. So uh, before we really end today's session, so we will take a group photo. So for those of you who can use the camera, you are expected to turn on your camera and may prepare your best pose. Jadi buat Bapak Ibu, uh, kita akan segera mengakhiri sesi kita hari ini. Jadi Bapak Ibu, kita akan mengadakan uh, foto bersama. Jadi Bapak Ibu diharapkan untuk membuka kameranya, lalu bisa menyiapkan pose-pose terbaiknya nih Bapak Ibu nih. Screen we apologize if we don't have more time for us to choose our best pose, so maybe the best pose can be quite representative. Jadi uh, kami mohon maaf juga karena waktunya sangat terbatas nih Bapak Ibu. Jadi kita nggak punya waktu tambahan untuk Bapak Ibu cari baju-baju terbaik dulu ya Bapak Ibu ya. Jadi yeah. bisa langsung aja dicari aja pose-pose terbaiknya sehingga bisa dapat foto yang keren-keren juga. Dipersilakan Bapak Ibu. Beta, beta, beta. Can you end the share screen first? Oh iya. Yeah, just yeah. end screen. So we can see the gallery view. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to take the pictures. So. Yeah, I would uh, like to ask Professor Chandra and Professor Marcus to smile at the camera. And I will be counting down from three. Okay. Uh, three, two, 
one. Okay, I will be taking the second picture. Three, two, one. Okay, Marcos, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Marcos. Thank you. Marcos, thank so, you. Thank you very much for your lecture. It's, 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 I really enjoy your lecture. So hopefully to see you again soon somewhere, some, <laughs> sometime probably in the near future. Thank you very much, Chandra. It was really a pleasure. I know that you are an expert on this treatment process. So it was a pity you didn't have much time to put your own experience, but I'm sure that all your colleagues and students from Indonesia, they already know your excellent knowledge on this. Maybe later on we can continue the discussion, this fascinating discussion. So I uh, thank you very much to Chandra and also to Beta for uh, giving all the organization and to everyone who was uh, listening to the presentation. I was very happy and I will continue very happy because I think this is very important for our countries. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Beta. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Welcome, bye-bye. Oke, okay, jadi dengan tadi udah uh, berakhirnya sesi hari ini, uh, kita kembalikan dulu nih uh, kepada Kak Saras nih, kembalikan kepada Kak Saras terkait menutup si sesi hari ini. Terima kasih semuanya, saya Beta undur diri. Ya, terima kasih Bapak Ibu telah mengikuti sesi dengan sore. Uh, selamat beristirahat dan selamat uh, melanjutkan kembali aktivitasnya sampai bertemu esok hari. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.